Welcome to the webinar on PFAS in the Nordic region. So what do we know about PFAS situation in the Nordic region and what can be done? This webinar is jointly organized by four Nordic research institutions and food authorities. From Denmark, we have the DTU National Food Institute. From Finland, the Finnish Food Authority. From Norway, the Norwegian Scientific Committee for Food and Environment. And from Sweden, the Swedish Food Agency. I'm Christine Nelleman. I'm director of the National Food Institute at DTU. But PFAS is a group of man-made chemicals that includes PFOA, PFOS, PFNA, and many other chemicals. PFASs have been manufactured and used in a variety of industries around the world <clears throat> since the 1940s. Certain PFASs, including the PFOA and PFOS, don't break down in the environment or in the human body and can accumulate over time. And they are also known as the foreign chemicals, forever chemicals, sorry. People can be exposed to PFASs in different ways. For example, through food, and food can become contaminated through contaminated soil and water used to grow the food through the concentration of these substances in animals <clears throat> via feed or water, and or through pa food packaging containing PFASs, or food uh, or equipment that contain PFAS during food processing. Exposure to PFAS lead to adverse health effects on, for example, the immune system or cholesterol levels. At this webinar, researchers, as well as food and chemical authorities, will pass on the current knowledge on PFAS in the Nordic region. How does PFAS affect health? What are the risks? Where is PFAS found and to what extent? What are the authorities doing? And how is it possible to remove or avoid PFAS? And what do we know and what do we need to know more? Thus, we hope that you will be informed and inspired by talks from scientists and authorities from the Nordic region on this important, important topic for all of us. More than 800 people signed up uh, for this webinar, which we are grateful for. We will therefore not be able to see you and you are not able to use your microphone and we will not be able to answer uh, all your questions. However, if time allows, one to two of your questions uh, can be raised after each presentation. So please go ahead, ahead and write your questions in the chat. We will be recording this webinar and make the talks and presentations available afterwards if agreed upon. Let me also remind the speakers to be sure to have access to this webinar via their special speaker link, so you're able to use a microphone and share your presentation. We'll try to, to make some interactions with all of you during the webinar, so please do not feel shy and take part of this exchanging of views and expectations. So let us start by the expectations of today. Um, so, please go to menti.com and enter the numbers you can see here. It's beginning with 18, 12, something, something. And when you're ready, give us a thumbs up here in the uh, function uh, in Zoom. And the question you're going to be asked, this first one is, what do you look forward to learn from today's webinar? And write your top three words. So we are waiting for your responses. And words comes up now. And you can see still many coming in. Analysis being one of the predominant ones. Solutions, knowledge, yes. Risks, new information, great to see. I hope, and I expect many of these things as well. So, so I hope also that we'll get a lot of knowledge and risks, risk analysis and risk management. And we are going to make these polls during the webinar. So, so please keep menti.com open so you can easily go in and, and uh, take part of the next questions we're going to write. 
and and uh, good. So thank you so much, and please keep on. But I'll introduce uh, the the first speaker today, and it's Professor Anne Marie Vingo. She is professor at the DTU National Food Institute, and her talk today is going to be on human health risks and main concerns of PFASs. Ri, I know you're here. Can you share your presentation and unmute yourself? Good morning, Christine, and thanks for the introduction. I will share my screen now. And... Yes, it's fine, we see it. Thank you. So I'm so happy that the Nordic countries have joined efforts in arranging this webinar. Uh, and I'm also happy that I can open this webinar with a talk here on human health risks and main concerns of uh, PFAS. I'll start by talking about what are the exposure sources and is the human exposure actually decreasing, increasing or unchanged. So this uh, slide here gives an overview of the sources of PFAS. As Christina said, it's a broad class of anthropogenic chemicals. And the recent number I've seen is that there are around 14,000 uh, PFAS, and they are extremely persistent, and some of them are bioaccumulating. So the major source of uh, contamination uh, with PFAS is uh, is uh, coming from industries that are either producing PFAS or industries that are using PFAS in their products or processes. And they, they uh, can release PFAS to the surrounding env environment, to land and to water. And the PFAS will end up in our foods or our drinking water, which we ingest by, by oral intake. We also know that firefighting films are containing PFAS and many uh, firefighting training sites uh, are contaminated with PFAS. And this uh, causes release of PFAS to the water, uh, groundwater and further on to our drinking water. Then there are a lot of uh, uh, consumer products that are containing PFAS. Christine also mentioned food packaging materials uh, such as paper and board materials that are coated with PFAS. And uh, the PFAS can either migrate to the foods that we're eating, or they end up as waste and contaminate the surrounding environment. Also textiles uh, used in furniture or our clothes can contain PFAS. And also other personal care products such as cosmetics or ski waxes are containing PFAS, which um, ends up as waste and which can um, contaminate the environment. So the oral route is the major uh, exposure route uh, in humans, although we can also uh, inhale uh, PFAS um, to a minor extent. So I think it's very important to discriminate between diffuse contamination of the environment and hotspot uh, contamination. Diffuse contamination is the contamination that is um, spread all over the world. And um, this happens as uh, some PFAS, they are volatile and they can evaporate to the air and be transported by atmospheric transport to other areas of the world, to even remote areas such as the Arctic area or the Tibetan Plateau. And uh, this diffuse uh, contamination is, is actually hard to do something about. We can regulate, of course, the PFAS and um, you know, abandon the use of them. And then we can wait for the, for the nature to break down the PFAS. Uh, but otherwise, I think we'll have to live with that for, for many years to come. Uh, then we have the hotspot contamination, which is the mainly around in industries using or producing PFAS or in, at firefighting training sites. 
And I think it'll be very important for the future to identify these hotspots in, in Europe and in the world in general, in order to identify which areas cannot be used for food production. So to sum up, uh, foods are the main source of human exposure to several PFAS, although there's variability across populations uh, and PFAS compounds. But drinking water can be the dominating exposure source in contaminated areas, such as hotspots, but also exposure from dust, personal consumer products, or the indoor environment and other sources can play a role. So if we look at exposure levels to PFAS, uh, we see here a, a graph illustrating PFAS in serum from uh, Swedish uh, first-time mothers uh, during the last more than 20 years. And we see when these 20 PFAS are measured, there's a, a marked decline in the total PFAS level of these, these 20 PFAS. It has declined to around one third. And this is good news because it, it uh, indicates that the regulation uh, seem, seem to work uh, to some extent. And if we look at the PFAS in breast milk, in also in Swedish mothers, we see um, we see also a decline when we measure these twenty five PFAS up here. The decline is not as marked as the one we see in serum, but there is a decline. So, but the problem is that the drinking water, human blood, and breast milk is analyzed for just a few parts per, per thousand of all PFAS. So we measure the known PFAS, which are the tip of the iceberg, whereas we do not measure the unknown uh, uh, PFAS here, which is uh, the bottom par part of the iceberg and which actually contains the majority of uh, existing PFAS. If we want to, to measure all uh, PFAS in a sample, we need to measure extractable organic fluor, for instance, EOF. And with this uh, method, we can analyze both the known and the unknown uh, PFAS. And this is what had been done here in the serum from the Swedish mothers. Uh, the blue column here, uh, columns here uh, illustrate the extractable organic fluor, which is a kind of a rough measure of the total PFAS levels in the serum. And then we do not see this uh, decline in PFAS exposure. So, and it may be because, um, and it's probably because uh, regulated PFAS or some of the known PFAS, they are replaced by new PFAS for which we do not have analytical methods to, to, uh, to, to measure them. So, um, so the, the picture is more nuanced um, when we are talking about human exposure. If we go to the other side of the Atlantic, to the US, there are some data here from the, from the last 25 years. I Sorry? on, um, on uh, levels in uh, human breast milk. And we see, again, a decline in PFOS and PFOA, whereas the short chain PFAS here are increasing. So this, again, indicates that these regulated uh, PFAS, PFOS and PFOA, they are replaced by shorter chain PFAS. Uh, and the exposure, at least in the US, is increasing to these compounds. If we take a more global perspective and look at it, uh, PFAS levels in wastewater from the last 15 years, we have this <clears throat> meta-analysis of more than 300 wastewater treatment plants from 17 countries. And uh, they have measured gathered levels, PFAS levels identified in both Africa, Asia, Australia, and in Europe. 
and then the picture becomes much more blurred and um, there seem to be in some cases unchanged uh, PFAS levels in wastewater when the average levels are calculated and for some of the shorter chain PFAS the levels are increasing in wastewater and this level in wastewater can give an indication of the contamination of uh, in the environment with PFAS and if we uh, compare levels of PFAS in wastewater in US and China, there's a marked difference. In the US, which is a blue graph here, we see a decline of PFOA and unchained uh, levels of most of, of the shorter chain PFAS here, whereas in China, levels are increasing for all these four PFAS. And this is probably because China is one of the main producers of uh, PFAS uh, nowadays. So there are some uh, heavy contamination there. So to sum up uh, the time trends on, of PFAS in biological tissues, some legacy PFAS have decreased during the last couple of decades in the Western world, whereas new PFAS seem to increase. But in other parts of the world, do the legacy PFAS still increase? Okay, and now to the health risk. What, what are the human health risks and how big is the risk? This uh, illustration here uh, gives an overview of the adverse effects that have been detected uh, following PFAS exposure. And the bold lines are those adverse events that have been shown with higher certainty, whereas the dotted lines are those that are shown have been shown with lower certainty. And I'll focus only on the bold lines here. So um, if we look at delayed mammary gland development, which is an effect on the fetus and severe liver damage, this is uh, adverse effects that have mainly been observed in rats and mice. And there's the challenge that the kinetics of PFAS is very different from rodents to, to humans. So it can be hard to translate these effects to the human situation. If we look at the um, severe thyroid disease, kidney cancer and testicular cancer, these Adverse effects have been observed in populations living in contaminated areas. So it can be around the 3M factory in the US or maybe uh, in, yeah, in other heavily contaminated areas. And finally, we have the, the adverse effects that have been shown in the normal population that is at normal uh, exposure levels. And this is uh, a reduced response to vaccines, lower birth weight, and also increased cholesterol levels. And these are the critical effects of PFAS and those that EFSA um, uh, identified as critical effects in 2020 when they made their large risk assessment of PFAS. But what, how, how big is this uh, effect and um, what is the risk? So if we focus on lower birth weight, this is uh, in, uh, in worst cases, this is maybe a reduced birth weight of around 50 to 100 uh, grams. And you can say for the individual uh, mother who it may not be you know, that important whether the baby weighs 100 gram more or less, but from a societal, perspective, it's not acceptable that we are exposed to PFAS that are able to, to reduce the birth weight of um, our children. Then if we look at the reduced response to vaccines, uh, this is really hard to, uh, to interpret the severeness of this uh, adverse event. It, uh, the effect depends on um, 
uh, at least three factors, you know, which population segment are we focusing on? Do we focus on children or adults? Uh, which vaccine are we, we focusing on? And, um, and also um, which PFAS are we focusing on? So um, in best case, uh, there's no effect on the antibody response by a doubling of PFAS exposure. In worst case, there may be a 50% reduction of antibody response with a doubling of a PFAS exposure. So, um, yeah, so uh, uh, generally PFAS, they, they are able to, to affect the immune uh, response of the children here. So, and what does this mean? We, we, this is still a, a matter of heavy uh, research efforts, but we have this uh, graph here, here from the US where they have uh, shown the risk of common colds in uh, children, uh, three to 11 years old. And uh, there's a, uh, an increase in the risk of common cold in the children with increasing PFAS uh, exposure. Whereas when they look in the teenagers, they see no such increase. So these data may indicate that for children, there's an increase of common colds with increasing PFAS exposure, but that the effect may disappear when the children uh, grow older. Then it's uh, it's you would really like to know if PFAS, increasing PFAS exposure causes an increased rate of hospitalization for infectious diseases, and there's not much. Uh, I could I didn't find much in the literature, but there's this Danish study in fifteen hundred Danish children where they associate maternal PFAS exposure to to increased. Uh, rate of hospitalization. And uh, we see here for PFAS, there's a hazard ratio of 1.23 for all infectious diseases. And uh, this means that there's a 23% a increased um, hospitalization rate with a doubling of PFAS exposure in the mother. And also, if we see here data for for uh, lower respiratory tract infections, and we see an increased hazard ratio here for both PFOS and PFOA. But we need to see more um, epidemiological studies on this and in order to have this uh, effect confirmed for in the future. So based, but based on this um, impaired va vaccination response, the EFSA said in, uh, in 2020, a tolerable weekly intake of uh, four PFAS, P4, PFOS, PFNN, A, and PFHXS of 4.4 nanogram per kilogram body weight per week. And this is the limit that we are using when we are risk assessing, uh, for, for instance, various meat, uh, meat or food products for risk and or also uh, drinking water. Uh, and so on. And this value, it is derived uh, from these uh, plasma profiles of PFOS and PFOA. Um, and um, they EFSA established this um, safe intake for women up till 35 years of age so they can breastfeed their children without them being affected by an impaired vaccination response. So based on the plasma levels here in 35 year old mothers, this, um, this uh, tolerable weekly intake was established. And then what are the mechanisms that are involved in this uh, impaired uh, vaccination response of PFAS? And this is a, also a field uh, that is that is um, heavily growing in these years and a lot of new studies are published on this um, this figure here from from this year 
uh, illustrates that PFAS are known to, to affect PPA and cytokine levels. They, they affect NF-kappa B and calcium signaling, and they are also shown to, to uh, inhibit antioxidant, antioxidant uh, defense. And, but it's still uh, a matter of research exactly what are the critical uh, mechanisms of action of uh, PFAS on the developmental immune system. Risk assessments of PFAS can be done in various ways. And if we use uh, food uh, levels, contamination uh, of PFAS in food, in various food, and, and uh, calculate the, to uh, the total um, intake of PFAS while the food, which seems to be the major exposure route in most cases, then uh, we can calculate a total intake take of 0.9 nanogram per kilogram per day. And this should be compared to the tolerable daily intake established by EFSA, which is 0.63 nanogram per kilogram per day. So there's a, an exceedance of, yeah, in this case, roughly estimated to be 44%. Uh, so, the, which means that a, a large part of the European population are exposed to PFAS to a, a large extent and to a too large extent. In the, the, um, in the HPM for Europe uh, program, we performed a, another a risk assessment of uh, PFAS mixtures based on human biomonitoring data from, from teenagers. And we had some very recent um, biomonitoring data for PFAS uh, in teenagers. And uh, here we, we calculated the mi mixture risk based on three different approaches, the red, green, and purple one. And I'll not dig into exactly how we did this, but uh, here's shown the hazard index uh, based on the 50% percentile in the teenagers uh, in these nine European countries. And we see that the hazard index is it exceeded in, in some of the cases and countries here when we use these average exposure levels. But when we uh, look at the 95% percentile in the teenagers, that is when we look at the highest exposed teenagers, we see that the hazard index is exceeded in most cases and in most uh, countries, which again confirms that we are uh, too high uh, exposed in, in Europe. So to sum up uh, on this, some legacy PFAS have decreased in humans during the last 20 years in the Western countries, whereas new PFAS seem to increase. In other parts of the world, legacy PFAS increases as well. Foods is typically the primary source of PFAS exposure in the normal population. And PFAS exposure in the normal population is generally too high and must be reduced. Impaired vaccination response, reduced birth weight, and incre increased cholesterol levels are the critical effects. And then we have to keep in mind that risk assessments are undertaken to protect the entire population. There's not necessarily a risk for highly exposed uh, individuals. However, from a societal perspective, it is not acceptable being exposed to PFAS to a degree that affect the unborn child. So this was what I would present today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very uh, much. That was a very good and comprehensive talk. So, so thank you so much. Uh, several questions in the chat, some are quite detailed. I think you might be able to, to answer them uh, at, in the chat maybe later on. Um, somebody asked about 
whether the presentations will be available. And we'll ask all presenters, uh, both for the recordings and their presentations. So, so I expect that most presentations will be available afterwards. So, so you don't need to note everything down. But if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A in the bottom of the Zoom panel. Panel. There's one question I would like to ask you, Uri, though. Which food items do you know about that are the most prominent for PFAS exposure? Yes. Can you put a, a yes, food that's item? That's a good question. Uh, we The data on uh, food contamination are still not, you know, really um, good and comprehensive. But we have some data, but we have to, you know, to interpret the data we care. But from these data, it seems as if fish is the major source of PFAS exposure. And that's very unfortunate as we need to eat fish <laughs> to, in order to have our brains developed and so on. But, uh, but uh, and it's uh, uh, mainly in lean fish, you know, compared to, to the PCBs and dioxins, which are mainly contaminating the fatty fish. So um, fish are a major source, but also animal products and the, uh, and actually, there are some data showing that fruits can be contaminated, but we are still very reluctant to, to believe in these data. Maybe they stem from hotspots. So, but uh, yeah, the future will show, tell more about that. And I think it'll be very important for the future to, to dig more into this, uh, to the PFAS levels in various food, side, food items. Thank you very much. Yes, a lot more data is needed. So thank you to you. And now I'll actually ask all the participants again to, to go into the menti.com um, and enter the numbers you can see on the screen. And when you're ready, you're welcome to give a thumbs up. So if you see this one, 1812 again, and then uh, another number. And lots of thumbs coming in. Thank you. So, so we join, uh, jointly make, organize this uh, webinar. So we would like to know whether you are from one of the four Nordic countries or for other, from another country. And so far I can see Sweden's leading on here. Denmark as well, but Sweden's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's great. And then the next one, if you're not attending from a Nordic country, which country are you from? So please put in Germany, Italy, Belgium. Very nice to see. So many good colleagues from all over Europe. Thank you. Great to see. So from Germany, the Czech Republic, Estonia. Yeah, yeah, Belgium. Lots of difference. You're most welcome. And, and thank you so much for uh, showing up and, and getting into this webinar we arranged here. Good. Then I'll actually go to the next speaker now. So this session, the next session is about the risk assessment in the assessments in the Nordic region. And the next one who's going to talk is Professor Christina Jakobsen from School of Public Health and Community Medicine, Skralinska, Salinska Academy, University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And Christina, I can see you're here. And you're going to talk about health risks after high exposure to PFAS in drinking water, experiences from Ronneby in Sweden. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you will be able to see my presentation. I can see you started screen sharing, so it's probably. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, 10 years of experience from a hotspot in Sweden, in Runneby, in the very southern part of Sweden. And what I would like to present is firstly a brief background of what happened in this municipality and our findings. And then I would like to put these findings uh, into perspective 
findings in background versus hotspot population about dose response and what that actually means for risk assessment and risk communication in different situations. So what happened in Runeby, a small, a small municipality in the southern part of Sweden, was that PFAS uh, was quite unexpectedly discovered uh, in December 2013, 10 years ago, in one of the two municipal water works. They had the possibility to immediately provide clean water from the other water works, but about one third of the households in the municipality had been provided with contaminated water. And it was clear that this had been ongoing uh, for decades. The contamination came from a military airport that actually was placed in the middle of a large groundwater basin. And they had used firefighting phones of the AFFF variety since the mid 1980s. But there were no more details available. And here you can see the water, the PFAS levels in the outgoing drinking water, uh, around 50 nanograms per liter in one of them, and more than 10,000 in the contaminated water works, providing about one third of the households with contaminated water. As a researcher, I can say that this was a natural experiment, but clearly for the population, this was a shock. Uh, and they clearly understood that they had been likely very highly exposed. There were no previous analysis of PFAS in the groundwater or the drinking water. But what was available was, on the one hand, the possibility to have personal IDs and address information for everyone living in the municipality since the probable start of the contamination and also information from the waterworks of, on how water had been distributed. So it was possible to set up a cohort with individual uh, exposure information to follow. Um, quite immediately, it was decided that there was a need to actually look at serum levels in the population. And everybody in the municipality was invited uh, to free open blood samplings over a long period of year. And more than 3,000 persons participated in this and got information about their individual levels of PFOSs. It was dominated by PFOS and PFHXS and to a lesser extent of PFOA. And here on this graph, you can see on the one hand that individuals uh, from, new, uh, from very small kids to very old people participate. And we found levels from uh, background levels to extremely high levels in the population. Uh, the green line at the bottom is actually where we had our reference population from a nearby municipality. So the contrasts are large. And if we compare uh, these findings with other hotspot populations, we actually uh, have to look uh, at the C8 studies from industrial contamination from PFOA in the US. And here, uh, they also had quite a large range of exposures from the low district to the highly contaminated districts with median levels around uh, two, 300 nanograms per milliliter and clearly individuals with higher levels. The findings in Rönneby, well, about the same median levels for PFOS and the same median levels for PFHXS, which means that in total, this population was even higher exposed than C8 if we sum up these individual P legacy PFAS levels. However, most studies on PFAS and effects have been performed in the background population. That is exposure levels in, uh, shown in, in these uh, red circles 
And it's also exposure levels at this range that is the basis for most of the epidemiological studies that have been performed hitherto. With simultaneous measurement of exposure and outcome in most studies, except for mother-child cohorts with longitudinal exposure. And clearly, one of the questions that we have is if studies with large exposure contrasts can help the evaluation of causality to go from associations to uh, good indications of causality. So we set out to investigate a lot uh, of different outcomes. And here uh, I have marked uh, some, not all, of all the endpoints that have been examined in epidemiological studies over the years. And I marked in bold those where there is quite an agreement that there is a clear link between exposure and outcome. And I have encircled what we up to today have published. Uh, we are going on and continuing with studies to look at other outcomes. And in summary, what are our findings from cohort studies and from biomarker studies? Marked in red, where we have found associations between higher exposure levels and an increased risk for the outcome. So as you can see, uh, some of them uh, are similar. Uh, some of the risks are found in our population, others not. So going back to my question, if studies with large exposure contrast can help the evaluation of causality, let's compare with the C8 studies dominated by FOA and uh, our studies. For cancer outcomes, we are quite consistent. No observed risk uh, for the main uh, tumors, prostate and, and breast in the populations, but clearly an agreement of an increased risk for kidney cancer and testicular cancer, perhaps also for thyroid cancer. Quite a few, uh, these are rare tumors and thus statistically uncertain, but the there is an agreement. However, for diseases, uh, we have less uh, information on agreement. On the one hand, because we have not parallel studies for all the main outcomes yet. And on the other hand, while we have parallel studies, no e agreement, for example, in diabetes. When it comes to uh, reproductive outcomes uh, looking at birth weight uh, there was no increased risk of less birth weight in the CH population uh, and a very marginal effect uh, in our population and I will come back to that later for studies using biomarkers yes a clear agreement when it comes to increased risk for elevated blood levels of cholesterol, and that was also seen in an Italian study in another hotspot, and no risk of increased or changed levels of thyroid hormones in these hotspot populations. Coming back to birth weight, uh, as we heard, uh, the estimate uh, for reduced birth weight is maybe around 25 uh, grams per increase of PFOA of one nanogram per liter, about the same for PFOS. But if that had been the case in Rönneby, in the most heavily contaminated part of the population, those babies should have been invisible, and they were not. Uh, in our study on birth weight, we compared uh, children with a mother living with or without contaminated water, uh, recognizing that even living without highly contaminated water uh, at home, you still sometimes had consumed such water. We compared with children from all the Blekinge County, 
uh, in all study about 10,000 individuals. And what we could see was uh, that for girls with a mother uh, living in the contaminated water district, there was an increase of about 50 gram in birth weight for girls and a decrease of 50 gram in boys. And if we should count back, that would mean about half a gram plus or minus per one nanogram per mil increase of PFOS levels. So here we have very different effect estimates if we base it on the background population or on a hotspot population. And this clearly leads uh, to the question of what is actually the shape of the dose response curve? Should we extrapolate upwards from studies in a narrow exposure range? I marked that uh, with a green arrow to the, to the right. Uh, knowing that studies within a narrow exposure range may be prone to inaccuracy of uh, measured exposure and misclassification, and also may be more prone to confounding and reverse causation. But what about studies at the high risk level and extrapolation? Uh, the hotspot studies in Rionneby or the CA population, we are uh, at the range depicted by the red arrow. So what about a median uh, range depicted by the green? by the yellow arrow. To me, there are still many question marks. Look at, for instance, uh, at PFOA and cholesterol. Uh, actually, the risk estimate from a Danish yellow population and PFOA workers uh, are very different, about the same effect with an increase of four compared to 1,000 nanogram per liter increase. The CA population gave something in between. And here is the dose response curve from Ronneby, showing quite a steep increase uh, at the lower end of exposure levels and then leveling off. And about the same pattern looking at PFOS or PFHXS, with a steep increase at low ends, uh, but then leveling off. So in summary, some of the previously reported associations were confirmed uh, in our findings, others not. And we have some new findings which need replication. And also clearly, Manifold higher exposure levels did not result in manifold higher observed risks. Uh, we heard before about uh, the difference between findings of uh, upper respiratory infections in children and not uh, finding the same increase in relation to PFOS in teenagers. We had the possibility when COVID come, came to actually look at uh, antibody levels and uh, T cell response after vaccination in a population with a new vaccine and a new disease. That is a situation that is quite common to the childhood vaccination scheme. And we could not find any difference in neither antibody levels nor T cell response uh, in persons uh, with high levels of PFAS compared to those with low lower levels or those from background populations. And these findings have also been supported by others uh, not only for mRNA vaccine, but also other types of vaccines. So this probably indicates that the immune system has matured uh, from the kids to young adulthood. Clearly, uh, risk assessment and risk communication is very different in different situations. 
On the one hand, on the one hand, we have to protect the population over generations. And here we ha have our regulations, we have our drinking water standards, our tolerable weekly intake calculations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Based on findings in background populations when it comes to epidemiology. And this is extremely important. But just as important is to have a possibility of good risk assessment and for risk communication in population with higher than background exposure. That is the hotspot populations that we know and those that we not yet know. And here we are again back. Should we extrapolate upwards? Should we extrapolate downwards from the very highly exposed populations to those maybe in the me median? And we have a lack of mechanistical understanding. Are there saturation thresholds? Are there other mechanisms? So we do need also to have more data, more epidata in the median range of exposure. But in the hotspot, our research as yet is about risk. We can find risk on group levels. We usually communicate this as relative risks, but the persons uh, in a hotspot want to know about risk on the individual level. Will I become ill? Will my child become ill? Is my existing illness due to PFAS? And I think that we need to learn how to communicate. Unusual diseases will still be unusual. Common diseases will become more common. No one will, will be either in the gray or in the red part of a, any excess risk. But to learn to talk about absolute risk and excess risk in these two situations will hopefully help the population to actually reflect on risk on group level, but also on individual level. The Rundi BPFOS research program is still ongoing. Uh, here you have my colleagues. We have qu quite a large infrastructure for uh, research. We have longitudinal registry studies. We have information from the child health care reaching uh, every child in the municipalities. We have our biobank with serum, with blood, with feces, placenta, etc., etc., which can be used uh, for uh, more mechanistical work. And we have our mother child cohort. And maybe that would be the most important part to actually follow up this cohort with extremely high exposure compared to many other mother-child cohorts and see what's happening for them. Thank you very much, Christina. That was nice. And you are ending here. So let me say that there are some questions in the chat and I hope, and it's not in the chat, and it's in, it's in the Q&A icon. So it's right next to the participant icon. So please go in there and, and both post your questions. And also as presenters, please go in the Q&A and, and answer some of the questions. But because of the time, I'll continue directly, Christina. But thank you so much for your very nice talk here today. But let me go to the next talker. And this is research professor Johannes Ruomi from the Finnish Food Authority. And you're going to talk about PFAS in Finland, dietary exposure with focus on occurrence in fish. And there are quite some questions about this. So, so we are looking very much forward. So please share your slide and take the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to give a presentation in this webinar. Uh, can you confirm that you can see my slides and in the presentation mode, please? Yes, we can. Fine, Johanna. Thank you very much. So, 
as uh, introduced, uh, I'm research professor in the risk assessment unit of Finnish Food Authority, and my field is risk assessment of uh, foodborne chemical hazards. And in this presentation, I will give you a very short overview on the dietary exposure of people in Finland to PFAS compounds. And uh, I will discuss in more detail the occurrence in fish, since as we heard, fish is a major dietary source for these compounds. And uh, in the opening presentation, you already heard that EFSA has set a tolerable weekly intake limit for the sum of four PFAS compounds. And I will only focus on these four compounds and uh, the exposure to their sum in this presentation. So uh, the things I was going to talk about here were already very uh, thoroughly covered in the previous presentation. So I will skip this slide and go to the question of how large is our PFAS exposure. According to the uh, exposure estimate uh, by EFSA in uh, 2020, there aren't very large differences in the amounts of dietary exposure in the Nordic countries. So I've picked here the mean exposure to the sum of the four PFAS compounds in Denmark, Estonia, Finland, and Sweden. And for these estimates, EFSA used the national consumption data of the countries, as well as occurrence data, which were mainly from the national monitoring in all of the EU member states. So the concentrations were more or less the European mean for each food type, and the differences in the exposure are mainly caused by the consumption habit differences. And uh, as you can see, the mean dietary estimate in all of these countries is higher than the tolerable weekly intake of 4.4 nanograms per kilogram body weight per week. In Finland, we have also biomonitoring results published by the Institute for Health and Welfare. And uh, they have measured the PFAS levels in serum samples of Finnish children and adults. And uh, surprisingly, the PFAS exposure based on the serum levels is only about one third of what the EFSA report estimated it to be. So based on this comparison, it is possible that the true exposure to PFAS compounds is a bit lower than we can estimate from the occurrence of these compounds in food and from the consumed amounts. And uh, this will, of course, lead to an overestimation of risk in the dietary risk assessment if we only look at the occurrence levels and the consumption, but as long as EFSA will consider the current tolerable weekly intake sufficient, we will, of course, continue to use it also in the national risk assessments. And in Finland, we published two years ago a national prioritization of foodborne contaminants based on the dietary exposure levels compared with the tolerable weekly or daily intake levels and on the seriousness of the health effects. And in this priority list, it was clear that the PFAS compounds were in the top 10 of all foodborne contaminants. And in Finland, we have also measured the PFAS concentrations, especially in fish from the Baltic Sea and Finnish lakes, both as part of annual monitoring and also as part of governmental research projects. And in the uh, next session, you will hear Rita Rannikko tell you more about the egg case. So I will only briefly mention that we also did a rapid risk assessment where the result was that 
uh, moderate use of eggs would not increase the current exposure levels excessively. And with the risk management measures in place, the exposure is already decreasing from what it was in the beginning of this year. But I will not go into more detail on that now. You will have to wait for Rita's presentation. And uh, for the rest of my presentation, I will talk about PFAS in fish. In the previous assessment of PFAS concentrations in fish from the Baltic Sea and inland waters of Finland was uh, done in uh, 2016. And the results show that both the fish species and the fishing area have a very strong effect on the concentrations. So on the slide, you can see averages from the pooled samples taken in the EU Fish 3 project. And the highest concentrations among the four fish species shown here were in Baltic herring uh, taken from the Bay of Bosnia. And uh, the concentrations were were more than twice as large as in the Baltic herring uh, caught from the Gulf of Finland. But uh, the trend between the sites was not uh, the same for all fish species. Anyway, based on these results, we noted that when estimating the dietary exposure, it is necessary to take into account the fish species and the fishing area, as well as the relative size of the catch in the different areas in order to weigh the result uh, so that you get the uh, usual uh, exposure of the whole population. And uh, we have an ongoing study on the Baltic Sea and inland water fish right now uh, it is called EU Fish 4, and uh, we are studying Baltic Sea fish and Finnish lake fish for the concentrations of PFAS compounds, in addition to other contaminants, including mercury and dioxins, and also nutrients. And the changes in the contaminant concentrations and other results will give information on the state of the water environment and on the fish stocks. We will also estimate the dietary exposure of Finnish adults from consumption of fish. And the exposure assessment will be based on the latest national consumption data, which was collected six years ago. But we will also uh, try to look at the future and estimate the exposure according to different consumption scenarios of the future. And one of these will be based on the newest Nordic nutrition recommendations. And in that, addition to the exposure assessment, our aim is also to estimate the burden of disease from the exposure to all of the contaminants and uh, do a risk benefit assessment on the fish use in Finland. And in the burden of disease calculation, we will assess the effect of uh, PFAS exposure conservatively by assuming that exposures above the tolerable weekly intake will lead to an increase of 10% in the respiratory infections of children which might be an overestimate, as you heard in the previous presentation. If you are interested in le learning more about the ongoing project, uh, we have the project website also available in Swedish and in English. And the quick link uh, you see on the slide, it will lead you to the Finnish website, but you can change uh, the language 
from the top right corner to reach the language version you prefer. And uh, on this site, you will find the final report of this project after it's published next April. And we will also link all of the open access scientific publications there later on. Since this project is still ongoing, I can't show yet uh, a lot of results, but the preliminary finding we have is that uh, there is a rising trend in the PFAS concentrations in at least some of the fish species. In the samples of uh, Baltic herring, which were taken last year and this year, some of the pooled samples had a PFAS content which was higher than the new maximum level. And the herrings from the archipelago sea and from the Bothnian Bay had higher PFAS levels than the other herrings, like in the previous years. And uh, in this figure, uh, which was uh, presented in the Fluoros conference, uh, you can see the sum of the four PFAS compounds in Baltic herrings, which was caught in 2009, 2016, and this year. And uh, the yellow dots are the newest results. And it looks like the distribution of the concentrations has increased a lot, and also the median and the mode have increased. But uh, these are still preliminary findings, and we will look at these results in more detail in the final report next spring. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Johanna, for a very nice talk. Because the time is a little bit, uh, a little bit late, I, I'll ask you to go in and answer and look at the questions in the Q&A and answer there. And I'll turn directly to the next speaker. But so thank you so much for, for this great talk, Johanna. So, Håkan, are you able to share your slides? You're going to talk on production of paper products identified as the main source of PFAS in polluted fish. Yes, I'll try to share my screen now. And you started sharing. It looks good. So only in presenter mode. Yeah. And you see Great. my presentation, so, right? Not the. Uh... Yes, we do. Thank you yes. so much. Please continue. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I will present a case uh, site where, um, yeah, which is quite, or it's different than the most known uh, PFAS polluted sites in Norway, because uh, at least in Norway, and I think in, uh, in Nordic uh, in general as well, uh, all severe polluted um, areas uh, polluted with uh, PFAS are polluted due to the use of AFFF or firefighting foam. But here we found a um, heavily polluted lake due to the production of paper products, uh, meaning uh, products coated with PFAS to make them fat and water repellent. So I, yeah. We have published several reports and as well as uh, scientific publications on our findings uh, at this site. And I, I'll, uh, I have listed uh, the literature at the end of my presentation. So uh, I will present the pollution in Lake Tyrifjorn. It, it is a large lake uh, quite close to Oslo. Uh, there is a lot of people living in uh, this area in Norway, and this lake is very popular for recreational fishing, uh, amongst other things. Uh, it is a very large lake, uh, as you can see here, and I just want to uh, show you this picture because it's uh, important to understand the extent of the pollution. So this picture here is taken from the middle of the lake, meaning that you can only see half of the lake. So this is a very large lake. And in 2015, um, high levels of PFOS were found in perch and fish, 
uh, which was very surprising because there was no known uh, big or major PFAS source nearby to this lake. So there is, for example, no large airport uh, draining into this lake. And based on our investigations, uh, we reported several main findings. And also based on our investigations, uh, Norwegian Food Safety Authority, they have advised against consuming fish from Lake Jyrkjörn and also in the river upstream, meaning that you are recommended not to eat fish from this lake at all. And we found that a factory producing paper products uh, was the main reason for the pollution in the lake. And we also found that the lake had very high concentrations of PFAS in fish and lake sediments. However, uh, concentrations in water uh, were very low, and that is different from what we see at other PFAS polluted sites uh, in Norway. And we have concluded that the fish in this lake it is taking up PFAS from its food rather than from the water it lives in. And I will now uh, briefly uh, go through uh, the evidence for these conclusions. So first we wanted to investigate what was the source of this uh, pollution. And from the first round of investigations, a factory producing paper products uh, and also a fire station nearby were suspected to be the source of uh, observed PFAS pollution in the lake. And both of these uh, suspected sources were located near a river upstream to the lake, meaning that runoff from both the fire station and the paper factory were draining into the river, which was uh, further transporting pollution into the lake. And we detected emissions from both of these sources. And as I said, uh, the use of PFAS firefighting foam or AFFF is the reason for all other uh, large uh, PFAS contaminated areas in Norway. So first we looked at the um, levels in fish and sediments near uh, those two suspected sources and we saw that fish and sediments directly downstream to the factory uh, had very high concentrations. Um, the factory is located upstream to the fire station as well, and we didn't really see an increase in fish and sediment concentrations downstream to the fire station, which uh, kind of indicated that the paper factory was an important uh, source to the lake. Then we looked at PFAS uh, concentrations and profiles in fish from the actual lake. Uh, and we saw that the pollution we found in uh, fish in the lake was very similar to what we found in fish directly downstream to the factory. But even more interesting is that we compared concentrations and profiles in fish from Lake Tyrifjorn to other contaminated lakes in Norway. So Lake Tyrifjorn fish, set different species are listed here within the red square. And if we, for example, compare perch concentrations here to perch concentrations in a lake polluted by the use of AFFF at an airport, we see that the so the sun concentration that we measured are quite similar, but in Lake Tyrifjorn, uh, we found a lot higher concentrations of these long chain uh, PFCA or carboxylic acids. Mm, those are uh, colored purple in this uh, figure while PFOS is green and precursors to PFOS uh, is colored yellow. 
And what we also saw was that we found quite high concentrations of these precursors to PFOS, this yellow uh, PFAS here, uh, compared to fish from the AFFF firefighting foam polluted lake where we found almost only PFOS. So the pollution, it differs uh, in Lake Tyrifjorn to what we see at other polluted lakes in Norway. Then we looked at sediment concentrations compared to water concentrations and concentrations in fish in Lake Tyrifjorn. And we saw that as already, uh, as we already knew, fish concentrations are relatively high uh, and PFOS it's one of the major uh, PFAS found in fish. But what we also saw was that water concentrations were very low uh, and comparable to what we would expect or what we find in a lake without a major PFAS source. So uh, the concentration we found was similar to what you would expect in drinking water, for example. So it's very low. And this is or was very uh, surprising because usually there is a relationship between concentrations in fish and concentrations in water. Uh, then we looked at sediment concentrations and we did find uh, relatively high concentrations of different PFAS in the sediments as well. But then after doing a literature study, um, we looked for other PFAS as well, uh, which are not uh, of the most well-known PFAS. And we found very high concentrations of especially this substance, sampap diester. It is kind of two PFAS molecules uh, linked together. And we know that this substance, it has been used in the paper industry. Uh, so it is kind of a telltale uh, substance for paper industry pollution. Then we also found from the literature that this sampap diester substance, it can be biotransformed into the shorter and more well-known substances, uh, including the precursors to PFAS, the one in, I call it yellow in my figures previously, and as well as uh, PFOS. So we know that in sediments and in biota, some of diester will be transformed into PFOS, indicating that the high concentrations of some of diester in sediments is uh, the reason for the high PFOS concentrations that we found in fish. Uh, so these findings, as well as others that I uh, have reported in uh, my uh, publications here, uh, based on those, we concluded that the factory that produced paper products was actually the main source of the contamination in Lake Tyrifjorn. And the most important reason for us to conclude on that was that we found very high concentrations directed downstream to the factory. Uh, the PFAS distribution profiles in fish and sediments were very different compared to sites known to be polluted by the use of firefighting foam. And we found very high concentrations of substances that we know uh, have been used by the paper industry, including this uh, sampap diester substance. So why are the concentrations in fish so high compared to concentrations in the water? Um, this was unexpected to us. So if we go back to uh, my model of the lake, we know that fish concentrations are comparable to concentrations that we see at lakes uh, situated very close to um, airports polluted by AFFF. But the profiles, the distribution profiles of PFAS are different in the fish. Uh, 
and we know that sediments they contain very high concentrations of these precursor to PFOS, uh, which we concluded was the reason for the high concentrations of PFOS in the lake. What we also uh, found from the literature is that this large sampath diester substance is it is very it's really not water soluble at all. So uh, people they did manage to measure concentrations of it in water, even though sediment concentrations were very high when they tested it in the laboratory, uh, meaning that when some pop diester is released into the environment, it will uh, stick to particles, for example, and then accumulate uh, in sediments. And so what we did was that we measured the concentrations of PFOS and PFOS precursors in the food chain in diff at different levels. And we found that concentrations of PFOS, it was decreasing at a much higher rate uh, up in the food chain compared to what we see at other areas. And we took this as uh, evidence of that some of diester from sediments is taken up into the food chain and then biotransformed into PFOS as it is transferred through the food chain. And this also means that fish in Lake Tirifion, it is likely not in equilibrium with the water phase. It is probably releasing PFOS into the water uh, uh, all the time. But because of the uptake of some of diester and other uh, precursor substances into the food chain, fish are constantly supplied with uh, PFOS uh, from the food. And th therefore, we believe that fish, it takes up uh, PFOS from food and not from the water. And, the, um, and this is a reason for the low water concentrations compared to fish concentrations. So it is basically because biotransformation makes uh, some of diester, for example, and other precursor substances uh, to change their uh, environmental properties, their water solubility, uh, because of biotransformation. So to sum up, why are the concentrations in fish so high compared to concentrations in water? It is because we have had very high emissions of precursor PFAS used by the paper industry. These precursor PFAS, they are not uh, water soluble, but they can be transformed into the more well-known PFAS, such as PFOS, which are slightly more water soluble. And also fish are exposed to PFAS uh, via food and not from the water phase. Here I've just uh, listed some of the most uh, relevant scientific publications we've made from this case site. And in addition to these, there are also reports from MGI uh, on this topic. Thank you very much, Hogan, for a very nice talk. So because of the sake of time, I'm not going to give you any questions from the Q&A uh, session, but please go in there and see whether you can answer some of the questions. We'll start with a new Mentima. So, so please go to menti.com. And when the system is ready, you will see a, a number on the screen. So please type in this number, 1812 again, and then some new things here. And the thumbs up, you already learned that, right? So so thumbs up when it's working. And then we'd just like to know whether you're from a private company, industry organization, public authority, research institution, or private citizen, or other, right? All of you are welcome. So it's just good to know where we're all from. 
So still public authority being most most of the ones present, but also private companies and research institutions. So great to see you all. And I hope now that most of you are all back from this very short break. And I'll give over the next talk to Linus Mustu and Hawk, who's actually going to talk about where the consumer meets PFASs in everyday life. And Lena, I can see you, and this is an extremely important topic. So I welcome you and hope you can share your slides and take the floor. Okay. Can we have yes, I can see your slides. Yes, thank you. It looks fine. Yeah, so I just need to see. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, back in January 2020, I finally convinced my uh, family, which consists of my husband and my two daughters, which were 18 and 21 at that time point, to watch the film Dark Waters with me. And for those of you that haven't um, seen that film, it's uh, mainly about PFAS in drinking. And um, also I should mention that already 13 years uh, before that, I had been working in the field of PFAS and trying to convince my family that this is such an interesting and important topic. But I'm afraid that I hadn't uh, really succeeded in, uh, in um, um, getting them engaged. So, uh, yeah, we start to film. And I can see that uh, during the film, they get more and more interested and also more concerned. So one film by the, um, versus the 13 years um, seemed um, uh, a little bit uh, disappointing for me. But still, when we sat there in the sofa after the film was done, um, suddenly my youngest girl, she said, Mom, you know, I'm playing a lot of football. Am I exposed highly to PFAS uh, from the field? And then my husband, which is a chef, he, he says, OK, so I'm so many hours in, in our kitchen. What about all the, all the kitchenware? Is this full of PFAS? And then finally, my uh, oldest daughter, she's a vegetarian. She was really curious whether uh, being a vegetarian could end up in a high exposure to PFAS or not. So why do I tell you this today? It's because um, I think this is quite typical. So many people have heard about PFAS. Mainly they've heard about it in relation to some kind of accident or maybe they've heard uh, about these uh, places with really high contamination. Um, but probably they're not that aware of where they can get PFAS in their everyday life. Okay, so as a researcher, I um, I have to look to science, of course. And this is the most recent paper that I've read on, uh, on the use of PFAS. And they actually identified more than 200 different uses of PFAS, 200 types of uses. And uh, also they found more than 1400 PFASs in these kind of applications. They also noted that, that almost all industries use PFAS and PFAS are in many, many consumer products. One other thing that I think is quite important from, from this uh, paper is that they state that there are often multiple applications within the same product. And uh, this is just one example uh, with the cell phone where there could be PFAS both in the wiring and in the circuit boards as well as in the screen. So not only are we exposed to many products, products with many different PFAS, but also within the same product, there could be many PFAS and in different places. So this is uh, from the scientific point of view, but then I would like to take it to a more practical level. So I will bring you through my day and give some examples on how I get exposed to PFAS in, in my daily life. 
So I'm getting up in the morning, going to the bathroom. What can I um, um, experience of, uh, of PFAS there? It can be in my foundation, in my sunscreen, the dental floss, the toothpaste, and even in my um, contact lenses that I have to wear to see you. And also in toilet paper, we can have PFAS. Okay, so we'll have some breakfast. What about the kitchen? Do I find PFAS there? Yes, I do. Both in my food, which we have heard about already today, and the drinking water as well. Also the cookware, food contact materials, but also food uh, floor polish. I'm ready to go to work. And outside my house, I can also um, experience PFAS in paint as well as in solar panels. And I think I even heard about windmills with BFAS. I enjoy um, going by my bike to work. And with my e-bike, I can, uh, can come into contact with PFAS both from the lubricants and also from the batteries. Finally, I'm at work. And here I can be exposed uh, or I can at least um, experience PFAS in, in uh, the LCD screens in printer rings and in air conditioning systems. In the afternoon, I want to go uh, for a hiking. And then I bring my car, which have PFAS in the vacs maybe, in the interior, as well as in the electronics. Then I'm ready for hiking. This is in the northern Norway, by the way. And do I experience uh, um, sources of PFAS there? Yes, both in my waterproof clothes and shoes, also in climbing ropes, fishing lines, and in the winter in ski bags. In the evening, I'm uh, quite exhausted and I want to relax in my sofa in the living room. Do I come in contact with PFAS there as well? Yes, I do. So um, also my sofa can have PFAS, the carpet, even the guitar strings, but also the house dust and the indoor air. So as you have heard now, we can um, meet PFAS in many, many places everywhere during our day. But then I would like to stress that finding PFAS in a product is not equal to being exposed to PFAS from that product. Uh, of course, if you have PFAS in many products, PFAS will leak out and end up in the nature, as we've heard, and uh, in our food and drinking water. And also we will have it in our indoor air and dust, etc. But it's not so that PFAS in a product necessarily mean that we are exposed to PFAS from that product. We should keep that in mind. But how are we exposed to PFAS then? I've divided into different exposure routes. So we can have PFAS from inhalation, either of indoor or outdoor air. We can um, be exposed to PFAS from dermal contact. This could be both house dust, but also products. And also ingestion is on, well, could be an important um, exposure pathway. And there we can ingest PFAS from food, from drinks. And I also actually eat some PFAS uh, in my house dust every day. But where do we get most of the PFAS from in our body? We already heard a bit about this, but I will take you through some more results. So um, to, to um, find out this, we, we did a study within the EU project called 18. We uh, recruited 61 Norwegian adults. Most of them were women. They were, had an average age of 42 years. And we calculated intakes of 13 different PFASs. And to calculate these intakes, we um, had to go to the participants' homes to collect their house dust, also to collect their air. And even the participants had to write down everything they ate during two days, and they had to weigh it all. And then also the participants had to, to take these uh, hand wipes. And we also took quite a few different other samples, like blood samples, etc., which I will not talk about today. But then based on these samples, we did the 
PFAS analysis, and then we calculated the intakes from the different exposure pathways that I mentioned before. So here you can see the median daily intakes of PFAS from the different exposure pathways. On the y-axis, we have dermal, indoor air, house dust, and dietary um, exposure. And on the x-axis, we have the amount of intake in picograms per kilogram body weight per day. And as you can immediately say, and was uh, see and was also said earlier today, diet is really the main exposure pathway on a median uh, basis. But then, since we have all these different samples from all the different participants, we also wanted to look at the uh, variability between the individuals, not only looking at the medians or the means. So this is the picture of um, the relative intake of the different uh, from the different exposure routes for the 61 participants. So on the x-axis, we have the 61 participants, and on the y-axis, we have the intakes, again in picogram per kilogram body weight per day. And it's the total of the, of the 13 PFASs. And also there is some color coding here. So you can see the green and greenish, that's from diet. And drinking water is included in diet here. And then yellow is house dust, is indoor air, and red is dermal exposure. And as you can see, there is variation in the intake, of course. And the longer you come to the right, the higher exposure you see. And also you can see that then it's not only green, which was from food, that, that is uh, uh, important in the bars here. So this indicates that, that also some individuals can actually have quite substantial intakes from other sources than from diet. Okay, so we wanted to look a little bit more into detail and um, look more into, into how personal care products contribute. So this we did in another EU uh, project, which is called Euromix, where we had recruited 144 Norwegian adults, mostly women again, and their age were between 25 and 72 years. And um, these people, we asked them to really register a lot of details on what they had um, uh, eaten. And also we asked them for many details about their use of personal care products. And then my, um, my colleague Trina, she did the probabilistic modeling of, uh, of the exposure. And the results looks like this. It's maybe a little bit complicated picture here, but I will tell you. Um, the most important uh, things to notice. So on the left-hand side, you can see the dermal exposure, and in the middle, you can see the diet. And what is actually interesting is the these yellow dots for the dermal and the, um, the pink, no, not the pink, the, the blue dots for the diet. You can see that there is some overlap. So the ones that have the highest level of the yellow is higher than the lowest from the, from the diet. So this uh, is why Trina uh, can um, conclude here that for PIFOA, I forgot to tell that this was uh, modeling of PIFOA. Um, for PIFOA, some people had higher intakes from personal care products than from diet. So this again illustrates that even though most of us get most from our diets, it can vary between individuals. And uh, I should mention that these are brand new results, which are not published yet, but, but they will come out soon in environmental research. Okay, so what about drinking water? We have already talked about that quite a bit. And um, um, Christina had some, some nice uh, presentation on, on uh, those experiencing high drinking water levels. I want to bring up again um, the levels in in this Ranabi study, where um, here we have the blue bars, that's the levels in drinking water of the four different or of four different PFAS um, in the Ranabi waterworks that we heard about earlier. And then the orange ones, which, which you could actually not see here on the picture, those are from the neighbor town called Karlsson. And even I should mention that the levels that, that Christina presented for um, um, earlier on, 
from from this um, other water works in the Ranupi, they they had uh, higher levels than uh, than the ones in Karsan here. Okay, so what I want to tell with this is that for general populations, we we see that approximately five to ten percent of the intake comes from drinking water, and that's when we have the levels that are like the orange ones that we can see. So of course, in such a situation with these extremely high levels in the drinking water, then drinking water will be the main exposure route. Okay, uh, also earlier today, it was mentioned that EFSA has set a tolerable daily intake of, uh, of these, uh, the sum of these four PFASs and concluded that more than half of the population um, the European population have an exposure that is higher than what is uh, considered safe. So there is clearly a need for reduction of exposure. So how can this be done? Of course, one thing would be to minimize what we use of PFAS in our products. And this is why I want to, to introduce this uh, concept called the concept of essential use which was developed um, by a group of scientists some few years ago. And uh, this picture here is from one of, of the publications, which I, I think is quite nice. It illustrates that we have a lot of functionality and also it's essential in many applications. On the other hand, PFAS also comes with some hazards. So then you have this balance between functionality, essentiality and the hazards. And Therefore, these scientists developed this concept of essential use. And I made a very uh, simple illustration here just to, to, to illustrate to you. So if we think about all the different use of PFAS, we can divide it into three different types. One is the non-essential use of PFAS, which could, for instance, be PFAS in my, in my foundation. And this is the grayish one here on the picture and then we have the blue part which is more important use of PFAS but where you have substitutes so you have replacement you can can um, replace the PFAS that have been used for these products before uh, with something else now so it's substitutable and then you remain with the third part which is the essential use where you need to have the um, properties that PFAS have and where you don't have the replacements yet. So then I think it's quite simple to understand that you can um, get rid of the non-essential use. You can also substitute. So you get rid of the use in the substitutable part and then you will remain with the essential use. And um, of course, it's not like in the picture here that there are one third of each kind of use. This was just for the illustration. But then you will see that that you end up in a step with um, instead with a much um, um, smaller uh, number of products where you have PFAS. And over time, of course, you can also try to find new replacements for the essential uses, so that you can also substitute those and gradually decrease the exposure um, from new use of PFAS. So then it's time to have some take-home mes messages, both to my family, which you can see here, and to you. So as you've now heard, PFAS are everywhere in so many different products that you can't even imagine where it is. But also we should keep in mind that PFAS in a product is not equal to exposure. Even though we know that the more uh, products with PFAS and the more PFAS in the products, the more will be released and end up in, in, in the nature, for instance. So indirectly we will get exposed, but not necessarily directly. That's important. Also I have uh, talked about today that uh, different individuals have different uh, major exposure pathways. Most people have, uh, get most PFAS from food, but also quite some few get get um, more from drinking water if the, those levels are high, or from personal care products, and even from dust and air. And finally, 
I would like to, to say that it's important now that we limit our uh, use of PFAS and uh, it seems quite obvious to me that we should replace um, and get rid of PFAS wherever it's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk, Lena, and also for keeping the time. I have two questions a little bit at light. Um, one is, are cookware lined with Teflon-like products? Do they release PFAS to the cooked food? And also, have you looked at the contribution from electric kettles for boiling water? So a little bit the same like uh, some of these products. Do you know anything about the exposure from those? Sorry, I just want to see if I can... can get it's under the Q&A &A yeah. in, in the bottom. And um, you're welcome to answer them, you know, in type answer, and then they, they'll they be under the I answer column. Sure. Um, yeah. There's something about okay. this cooking ware. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear your question at the same time. Can you please repeat it? Yes. So are cookware lined in Teflon-like products? Do they release PFAS to the cooked food? And also contributions from electric kettles for boiling water. Have you seen anything from that? Um, for the last one, uh, I, I haven't seen some studies yet uh, that um, that have detected in, in water with, uh, with these electric kettles. When it comes to the cookware, um, there are some released, but but I think the studies conclude that there are not this. This is not the major um, major exposure uh, to through food. So so it's more in the food itself than what you get from from um, the cookware. Okay, thank you very much. And I can see several other questions coming up. So please go in the Q and A. And, and look at them and type the answer in there. And I'll continue to the next speaker, but thank you, Lena, for a very interesting talk. But the next session is called Overview of Risk Management and Monitoring in the Nordic Region. And we'll start out with Head of Office, Henrik Søren Larsen from the Danish Ministry of Environment. And Henrik, your talk is titled Overview of Monitoring and Risk Management of PFAS in Denmark and Regulatory Foresight at the EU level. So Henrik, I hope you're here and you can take the floor and share your slides. Yeah, great. But thank you very much for inviting me to, to give uh, you uh, an overview of uh, monitoring and risk management of PFAS in, in Denmark and also uh, a regulatory foresight at the EU level. And uh, some of the former speakers also uh, touch upon, uh, let's say, uh, some of these issues here. But first, uh, it, just to say, it was a couple of years ago that we had a wake-up call in, in Denmark. It was uh, the so-called uh, Corsair case, and probably you have heard about it already. Uh, but uh, what was uh, found was unexpectedly high levels of PFOS in a suit treatment plant in uh, in Slagelse. And it turned out that uh, the sewage came from a uh, firefighting training ground area. Uh, and that started to, to find out uh, where did this, uh, let's say, PFOS from, uh, from the firefighting foam came from and where did it end up? And unfortunately, it also turned off that some of, of the runoff of water from this uh, training ground area ran down to a small stream and further out to a meadow. And uh, as a result, uh, the cattle there grazing on the meadow was exposed to uh, high levels of PFOS. And also as a, a result of that, there was a cow grazing community there. And uh, that means that the, the people there, they, uh, they have their own uh, cattle uh, grazing on, on, on the meadow there and they had a really high uh, exposure to, uh, to PFOS uh, due to that they ate meat from the same cattle uh, day out and day in. So that was really a wake up call. And uh, we had to, uh, to go into, uh, have a look, a systematic look on uh, where do we find PFOS in Denmark and PFAS uh, as such, both on monitoring and risk management. 
And I must say that also we just heard about the drinking water in the uh, Rønneby uh, a few minutes ago and saying that the uh, exposure levels from the people in Korsøer are similar or lower than those in, in Rønneby, uh, but, but still a very severe case. So uh, when we had a new government uh, in December 2022, uh, in fact, it was part of the coalition agreement that we should prevent, contain, and clean up PFAS contamination. A concrete follow-up on already decided national action plan must be ensured. And uh, well, it's a little, uh, let's say, uh, a little bit of a joke because there wasn't any decided national action plan yet, but, but uh, we are working on it. And I'll come back to that. Uh, and furthermore, also it said that the government will work uh, towards a ban on PFAS substances at the EU level and on limiting the use of PFAS substances in Denmark. So that's what we're doing right now. So if we uh, go to see uh, the budget uh, here and compare to, let's say, the scale of the problem, uh, it's quite a limited amount of money with that until now been set aside for, for the issue. But in 2022, uh, 3 million extra was set aside for, for uh, developing uh, PFAS cleaning methods. Uh, furthermore, in, in 2023, that was raised to 10 million uh, kroner to one or more demonstration projects for cleaning up PFAS contamination. And the purpose was to boost the development of technologies to clean up soil, groundwater, and drinking water. And further was also set aside 3 million in 23 and 5 million in 24 for a new PFAS task force, uh, which uh, consists of 10 uh, scientific experts who, in fact, just had their first meeting here last week. And the purpose there is to, to gather uh, existing knowledge nationally and internationally and by the end of 2023 to point out knowledge gaps. And then building on that uh, by the end of 2024 to come up with recommendations for a prioritized effort on PFAS contamination. Uh, let's say our regional uh, authorities uh, would get another 20 billion uh, this year for cleaning up contaminated land. And of course, that's a uh, well, really little amount of money for actual cleaning up, but quite a lot of money for, let's say, screening where to do something. And then uh, finally, uh, the budget for next year's uh, Finance Act was published here in the end of August. And uh, there was a, uh, an account for different initiatives on environment, including a PFAS action plan where approximately 200 million Danish crowns are set aside. So what have we done since uh, Corsura? Well, first of all, we set down a coordination uh, unit between uh, all relevant uh, authorities. And we meet uh, between two and four times a year and uh, exchange uh, what has uh, you done at the level of communities, at regional levels, and the different state uh, institutions. So that has been very, very useful to, uh, to, to help us, uh, let's say, move in the same direction and knowing what uh, each other are doing. Then there would have been, as one of the first things we did was to map the firefighting training grounds. And one can, of course, uh, discuss why haven't we done that before, but we didn't. So, and we found, I think it's around 100 different firefighting training grounds and uh, uh, quite a high frequency of these have a uh, severe uh, pollution with especially PFOS. Uh, but also other PFASs. We have a specific website uh, containing information. We set stricter requirements based on the hills assessment, and I'll come back to that. More monitoring, come back to that, and also injunctions on industries, landfills, and more controls uh, and enforcement. So if we turn to uh, the monitoring, especially, so for drinking water and groundwater, we have uh, changed the rules. So in fact, uh, all uh, drinking water uh, wells should be checked for, for PFASs uh, within a certain limit uh, uh, deadline. 
So, uh, so quite extensive. Before that, it was could be up to three years between uh, that you had to test for 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 PFAS. We went to to the sea to passing waters and put foam. I'll come back to that. We have checked on soils and drain water, and that's especially in connection to these uh, firefighting uh, places, but also other known contaminated sites. Increased monitoring in streams and lakes. I'll come back to that. We also went out to uh, to monitor uh, wildlife and game animals, and in fact, uh, one of the surprising uh, results of that was uh, that uh, we find really high concentration of PFAS, especially uh, at the coastal areas. So migrating birds, uh, dogs on the west coast of Jotland, for example, well, they are not really suited for, for eating uh, anymore. But we don't know whether it's a local uh, risk or whether it's uh, something they picked up uh, other places because they are uh, migrating birds, but also other kind of game can be at risk there. And then finally, we looked at the wastewater and especially also at the wastewater sludge, which we use for, um, uh, for fertilizing our uh, fields. So here's a, a couple of points here on what we did to make stricter requirements. First, for drinking water, uh, but also soil and groundwater. But as a result, as a new, very strict EFSA uh, TDI, which came a, a couple of years ago, we uh, lowered uh, the, uh, the quality standards for drinking water to two nanograms per liter for the sum of four PFAS. So that's uh, PFAS before and uh, two more. And that's, I think it's the lowest uh, quality standard for drinking water uh, anywhere on the globe. Uh, and then we also, for the sum of the other PFAS, where we uh, before had a, a quality standard of 100 nanogram per liter for the sum of 12 PFAS, we have changed that to the sum of 22 PFAS. Uh, and that uh, means that we have new requirements now uh, calculated for soil, calculated for groundwater, which is the same as for drinking water, for drinking water. And we are working on an indicative uh, value for wastewater sludge, which I'll come back to. Uh, and also, we have been working on, on a revision of an indicative limit values for industrial wastewater. And that's the reason is that in Denmark, we, uh, we regulate uh, emissions from uh, industries uh, at the site of the uh, municipal sewage treatment plant. But how to, uh, to go back in, in the chain at the source of the PFAS and what would be uh, the limit value to regulate each individual industry on is, is the purpose of this exercise here. And then we have also had a, a revised instructions on emissions of, uh, of uh, environmentally harmful substances from sewage treatment plants and how to deal with that. As a result, also what we learned from, from uh, from Slales and Corsair. At the same time, we're working on an EU proposal together with Sweden, Norway, uh, the Netherlands, and Germany on all, all non-critical uses of PFAS. I'll come back to that. There's EU ban on PFAS in firefighting foam on its way. Uh, but also there's EU proposals on uh, environmental quality standards for PFAS in surface water and groundwater as a, a revision of the water framework uh, directing uh, and much more, many more substances will be covered then uh, and also at lower values. So let me turn to some results. As I said, uh, we did a lot of monitoring and screening uh, in the environment, drinking water, passing water, sea, streams, lakes, and so on. And here's a few uh, results. Um, we uh, monitored in, uh, in fish of fish. Uh, and water in streams and lakes. And in generally, and that was good news, we didn't exceed the environmental quality standards for PFAS in biota. And we only look for PFAS here because that's the only regulated PFAS in uh, current legislation for freshwater. 
Uh, if we looked at the water concentrations, we had exceedance in nine out of 27 places in streams. And if we went to the sea, uh, it's a little the same picture, uh, no exceedance of uh, in, in fish uh, and biota, but we exceed how we exceeded uh, the quality standards in eight out of 20, 20 measurements in the North Sea. So uh, even the open sea is not clean enough uh, for uh, avoiding risks here. So here's a, another case story. Uh, this is about groundwater and drinking water. So we did a lot of additional monitoring in, in groundwater uh, and drinking water also. And in groundwater, in the drillings, uh, we found that 0.3% of uh, the sum of 12 PFAS was exceeded, exceeded. That is 100 nanogram per liter. So in 0.3%, we exceeded the 100 nanogram per liter. But as I just uh, told you, we also lowered uh, our new uh, regulatory uh, quality standards for ground motor and drinking motor to two nanograms per liter for the sum of four PFAS. And there, uh, it's more, much more critical. So there, we exceeded in the, around 6% uh, this low limit value here. Not necessary uh, use drinking water because we had uh, different uh, restrictions to avoid that this water would be pumped out to, to the consumers. So in fact, the latest status for drinking water controls is that we exceed the limit value for the four PFAS of two nanogram per liter at free public water supplies. And they now uh, receive emergency supplies from other sewage, no drinking water treatment plants should be here. So uh, uh, sorry Pierre, uh, about this uh, typing typo here. Uh, but, but just really interesting, where is some of the critical issues? So uh, at the picture at the right of, of uh, the screen here is uh, an island called Fainu. And as you can see, the red spots there is each of them represent a drinking water well. And you can see all of them almost exceeds the limit value of the quality standard. And that's even though that we have no records of uh, any fire, uh, fighting there, any industry, or anything else. So the only thing that is there is it's close to the sea. And in fact, the same picture is from uh, the what you can see at the, the picture in the bottom, where you uh, had Skagen, the tip of Denmark, uh, and all drinking water wells in uh, the plantation outside Skagen with no records of any industry use there exceeded the drinking water values. And the same also accounts from uh, another place. You can see a little further to the uh, uh, Southwest here. So in both cases here, uh, they had to do something. Uh, in Fano, uh, they had installed a new uh, treatment plant for drinking water, very really special one. It's rather expensive for the community there. And in uh, Skane, in fact, they installed a new pipeline so you had to bring water to scale from 40 kilometers away to get a sufficiently clean uh, drinking water. So turning to the sea, in fact, which is a big problem here. So we went now to see what about uh, bathing water. And the bathing water quality standards is 20 times the drinking water standard. And uh, fortunately, we do not exceed the bathing water standard of 40 nanogram per liter, except with some kind of inland uh, small lake, uh, which was a temporary uh, inland lake uh, on a beach. But if we try to measure on the sea foam uh, created by the, uh, the waves of the sea, you find extremely high concentration of uh, PFAS. And that means also that this uh, foam is uh, by the wind blown into the land, and in fact, uh, our Veterinary and Food Administration took samples on uh, 60 to 67 grass uh, areas where uh, our uh, Nature uh, Administration uh, had some kind of uh, uh, cows, uh, cattle uh, grazing there. 
And uh, so do they exceeded the indicator value for 60 out of 67 grass samples. And that means in fact, that each of these cattle there, you need to take a, a blood test. And uh, then you uh, probably would need to, to uh, take the cattle out of the food chain until you uh, and uh, feed it with some other uh, fodder from uh, other places to be able to show that the PFAS uh, concentration lower again and decrease again under uh, the allowed uh, living value. So very, very uh, uh, severe that uh, almost all places coast, uh, close to the coastal areas is at risk. In relation to wastewater sludge, also there, we have done a lot of risk assessment here uh, and about to, to uh, revise our uh, regulation about it. But uh, the indications was that uh, quite a high frequency of the wastewater sludge would uh, exceed what would be an acceptable level of uh, PFOS, especially in, in the sludge. Uh, and we need to do something about that. And finally, I can also say that regions have uh, estimated that we are about 16,000 sites, that due to the use patterns of the industries there, we are at a risk of PFAS contamination. So uh, as a result, there's been some uh, legal action. Injunctions have been issued to landfills and companies uh, from the Danish EPA. Uh, and also there's been quite some uh, control and enforcement going on. And especially this has been uh, in relation to uh, firefighting and old uh, firefighting installations. We haven't found really in on products, consumer products, we haven't really found any exceedance of uh, the regulatory uh, values. But also you, you have to, to uh, acknowledge that very few PFAS are in fact regulated uh, today. So that's why we try to, to do an EU ban uh, so it should be a wide reaching uh, EU ban uh, covering almost anything from uh, uh, production to, to use. And uh, as I said, together with uh, four other uh, countries here. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for our uh, EU ban here, we make temporary national regulations. It'll be uh, on firefighting, on training grounds. And uh, in fact, we have notified this ban to the EU and uh, await wait here uh, with the end of September to see whether we can issue uh, our statutory order and it can enter into force by the 1st of January. And at the same time, we look at other possibilities of uh, limiting use of PFAS. Uh, it could be on a voluntary uh, basis or uh, perhaps also more regulation. And here's uh, the timeline on, of the phase out if uh, everything goes uh, smooth on the EU ban. So up to 13 and a half years from now, uh, there'll be use in industry, but uh, a lot of uh, consumer uses should in fact uh, disappear one and a half year after that we have decided on the EU ban. So hopefully something like uh, 2027, we are there. So to conclude, it was a wake up call in Denmark by the case of Corsair, uh, and it has led to extensive PFAS surveys and monitoring. And I must say that we found and then find a PFAS almost every place, especially PFOS and PFOA, where we look for it, uh, including stream, seawater, sea foam, wastewater, sludge, grass, farm animals, and also uh, game animals. Uh, we have set a uh, new limit and indicator values uh, in place for PFAS in the environment. And this is both for drinking water, groundwater, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we have, as I said, uh, the lowest uh, quality standards uh, on the globe for these uh, uh, drinking water, especially. The EU restriction dossier is uh, is uh, going on right now. Uh, the hearing, public hearing, is uh, ending by end of September. And uh, if we manage uh, to uh, get an agreement, we will reduce uh, emissions of PFAS to the environment by four and a half million tons almost over the next 30 years. 
We have natural restrictions of use of PFAS on the way for uh, firefighting plants, uh, training areas, and finally, uh, the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Food, and the Ministry of Health are working on a PFAS action plan in accordance with the government coalition agreement. So thank you very much for uh, listening here, and I hope uh, uh, you found it interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. We definitely found it interesting. I can see some questions for you in the Q&A. Uh, I, I think you answered the first one on the waterworks, but please go in and have a look at the next ones. And I'll turn to the next speaker of the day. And it's uh, Senior Advisor Julia testdale Holland from the Chemical Food Safety at the Norwegian Food Safety Authority. And your talk is going to be on surveillance programs and limit values on drinking water, meat, seafood, and eggs. So we continue, of course, in the same and very data dense uh, area. So Julia, are you here? And can you share your slides? Yeah, thank you, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and yeah. see you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll see and try to hope I have shared the correct yes. screen. Yeah, now I see, you can it. see it. Yeah, in presentation mode, I hope. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, risk management of, of PFAS in Norway and come into the, as you say, monitoring and also some of the regulation which we have in place. Um, firstly, I would like to talk uh, a little bit about how to manage the risk uh, when it comes to common contaminants in food. Um, these are substances which are not intentionally added to the food. So we look at occurrence data and set limits based on the ALARA principle. And that is as low as reasonable achievable. So we can't ban um, uh, substances. And then, and then it's important to, that, to know that we can't set them uh, so low that we have to uh, maybe throw out throw, uh, or uh, make a, a lot of food non-compliable to these limits. So this is uh, one of the bases. Um, so setting limits is one thing. And then we also have our control plans, uh, which is like official controls to verify compliance of these uh, limited limits. And these are in place from uh, this year. Um, it is on a, we have a like, more elaborated uh, control plan in, in, in um, at the moment, and then we have also um, PFAS is, is one of those we are controlling since we now have, have limits for these in a few commodities and foods groups. But sometimes um, we don't have the possibility to set limits um, or the existing limits. Uh, as I mentioned, we had set maybe so high that uh, we can't minimize the risk from the food intake for maybe vulnerable groups. Um, and this is uh, one example of this is um, is uh, like for mercury in in some fish groups. So we have uh, in in um, we have a limit for mercury in in tuna, but we also have uh, in our uh, web page and on, on our communication uh, risk ad ad like, um, advices for pregnant women or uh, planning to get pregnant pregnant or um, which are breastfeeding to not eat tuna. And sometimes regulating is, is not suitable. And that's for like homegrown vegetables or sport fishing. Um, it's, uh, we can't um, limit uh, people who are, want to go fishing um, in maybe highly polluted areas. We only give advices that you shouldn't, but it is up to you what you want, but we can't regulate it. Um, and also the monitoring is really, really important. So um, for as a basis for doing this regulation. So we can't have limits if you don't have enough occurrence data. And it's also very important to strengthen the basis of exposure assessments. And I don't want, I won't use much time on this um, slide because we have been uh, gone through a little bit of this already. Um, and also I just want to highlight the last one. Uh, that this is really important for um, stop 
making this uh, uh, pollution and, and, and in the future near, not so near maybe, but in, in the future, it, this hopefully will be a problem that is not that as high as it is now. And here you see the limits of uh, where we have the most occurrence data in the foods, and that is in meat, egg, and fish, and other seafood. In Norway, we have a drinking um, water. We have been uh, thinking about or asking, are the limits which are set in the drinking water directive, is that, are those um, low enough? Is, it, um, is these limits safe? So we have actually asked our Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and which has assessed whether the maximum limits of the 100 nanogram per liter for some of for 20 PFAS is safe. And, and if not, which value could be more safe? Um, and the limits uh, which they have um, looked at is when they take into account the um, health-based guidance values from ESSA, they see that a limit of two nanogram per liter uh, for the four PFAS would be compatible with safe exposure. So this is something we have got an assessment from the, um, the as Norwegian Institute of Public Health and which are, we are now uh, doing our assessment or considering whether a national maximum limit is feasible and, and timing a such measure. Um, and uh, it is um, probably not before the lim at least not before the limits for the um, drinking water directive in the directive is um, applicable. So it will not be in the very near future. And then we have come to the consumer advices, and we have a lot, uh, a few of those. Uh, and um, uh, some have already mentioned this. Um, and we have um, advice against eating fish and drinking water from freshwater near airports. And you know, you have heard, heard about a lot of reasons why there are high levels of PFAS near um, drinking water and then near um, airports. I'm sorry. So, um, so this is uh, what we have seen, and we are also here got. Um, the National Public Health, Norwegian Public Health Institute of Public Health, uh, to to um, uh, do some assessments, and based on their those assessments and the and findings of the the levels of the PFAS in in these uh, waters, we um, we uh, have advice like a general national uh, advice, and we also have a specific uh, on the Tirifjorden. And then that you have already heard uh, a lot about um, from 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 Harvard, so I don't want to go too much into this um, either. But what about when we don't know? We don't have we have for many um, foods food groups we don't know. Um, we have no advices regarding PFAS and, for example, vegetables in Norway. Um, and we get a lot of questions. We get questions from farmers, consumers, and also media on how can is it uh, if you water with um, your vegetables with high uh, with water with high which we find high levels of PFAS. What about cattle and sheep grassing in and near polluted areas? And also, for people have private wells near airports. Um, and um, these are some questions we don't have the good answers on yet. Uh, we have a lot of lack of data. We have um, a lot of data. I will come back to that for in in fish, uh, but we don't have a lot of data in vegetables, and we don't know all of the fates of these substances. So this is something we need to do more on. But we look to Denmark because we have seen that Denmark has done a lot of this also and see if there are some similar similarities we can use in our communication out to the consumers. But for us now, we have to communicate what we know, but also what we do not know. And be, I think it's an important to be honest and, and, and um, and also say what we actually do not know. 
dialogue with the industry is also something we see as an important um, way of um, managing risk. Um, it's um, uh, our PFAS will be, as I mentioned, a part of our upcoming control plans for those PFASs where we now have limits. Um, but also guidance we see is important to 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 help identifying sources. Uh, if there are any reducing measures to do, to take in place, to okay, when the limits are high, all the levels are high, is uh, are there any techniques you can use which reduce these uh, levels? It, um, and um, as we see, for for example, drinking water, uh, the concentration of some PFAS can be reduced by water treatment. But the limits on this water treatment, uh, the, the, the knowledge on this um, water treatment and PFAS is, however, quite limited yet. Um, so, um, and also we have, I mentioned that food contact materials also could be a source. And there's also, we don't have any national bans on, on the PFAS in paper and board, but um, we recommend not using it. Uh, so, yeah, exchange of knowledge to identify and avoid sources of contamina contaminations are really important. And then I'll come to my last slide, um, and I want to highlight the importance of this uh, being done uh, of monitoring. Um, because this is a basis or uh, is like an essence, essence to do good risk management, we have to know what are the levels. Um, and uh, monitoring of um, PFAS, we have done that in seafood since 2007. Um, and uh, most of the, um, the values or levels we find is not quantifiable. Uh, but um, the methods being used has varied the sensitivity as the sensitivity and the methods has varied between the years um, and some of our uh, quite few of our results LOQ is quite high so it's difficult to say if all of these limits um, or levels which we find is actually below um, the levels or the maximum levels we should set but uh, um, so now we are now uh, doing more analysis on PFAS with uh, more sensitive methods. So that's an important way forward to do, have enough um, sensitive methods to do the correct analysis. We have some analysis done on food contact materials in 2015 and 2018 done by the DTU, uh, which also gave us a little bit information about uh, the use, but it's um, it's only a few products and, and it's uh, indication. We can't say much about it, but it is an indication where we can, uh, um, if we find these products in. And then we have done analysis of PFAS in fish feed since 2017. Um, and there we find uh, quantifiable levels in about maybe 30% of the samples. Uh, but as there is no limits in feed yet, um, but these, these data will be important in, in the discussions in the future, in, in the case uh, this will be up in the, group, in the working groups in the commission. There is a need for current data on more PFASs and foods. Uh, and uh, we have uh, maybe a lot of data on PFAS, the four PFASs, where we have the limits. But there are a lot of other PFASs we don't know so much about, which some already has uh, said something about. But also foods, other foods. Um, these um, substances are not like the dioxins, where we we can predict that we only find it or mostly find it in in fatty food. These are made probably in all, everything so and everywhere so we um, do, need, do need to do more analysis of vegetables and, and fruits and again with 
more sensitive methods. So it's important that we have these um, where we can, when it's not quantifiable, we can say that, but, and then it's low quantif and low Qs. Um, so, um, and also I would just mention in PFAS, the monitoring in the environment, which is done um, quite extensively in some places and not maybe another, but here it is also important to indication for us uh, if it could be a problem in the food. So to find out where the risk is, um, which communities we can rule out, if we can rule anything out of the foods um, regarding risk for health, um, it's um, important to do more monitoring. So this is just shortly about the things that I have, and then I'll um, hope um, we we'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Julie. There's yeah. one question in the Q and A about fish meal for egg production, and will you monitor that? And I hope you can answer mm. in the Q and A. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, time is unfortunately yeah. up as well, but uh, but there's still a lot of Q and A's. You cannot from the participant side raise your hand. I can see a few try that, but post your question in the Q and A, and it got uh, gets answered, and then you can see it in the answered column. But mm -hmm. I'll ch uh, change to the next speaker and thank you again, Julia. The next speaker is Carl Lilja, who is a senior scientific advisor of the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. And your talk is called or titled PFAS in Food, How Does Environmental Contamination Affect Food Production and Human Exposure? And I can see you already started sharing, Kalilia, so that's good. Yes, uh, I will see if I can get it to... Presentation uh, So, mode, maybe? presentation yes. mode, is it okay now? Yeah. Uh, thank yes, you, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's been really interesting to listen. Um, my name is Carl Lilja, and I work at the Swedish EPA with the monitoring of hazardous substances. And the last almost 10 years now, this has meant an increasing focus on PFAS. I'm going to tell you a little bit about an ongoing governmental assignment that we have together with the Food Agency and the Agricultural Board. I will not answer the title in the presentation, but I will tell you about what you are doing to gain more knowledge. Let's see, Let's see if I can. I'll do like this. Um, the background. So that we are doing this is mainly two things. First, we have the EFSA opinion from 2020. Before that, focus in Sweden was mainly on contaminated drinking water and fish from contaminated sites. However, the reduction in exposure levels considered safe imply a change in, expo in exposure pathways that can be relevant. And now we could potentially have problematic exposure also from other food items. In addition to this, much of the exposure data, as you've heard, is left censored. That means that it's below the reporting limits, uh, resulting in uncertainties in exposure assessments. Uh, second, we have a lot of contaminated sites in Sweden, but a lack of information if and when this is potentially problematic for food production. And during the last years, we've seen an increasing number of reports from other countries on contaminated eggs, milk, and meat. First from Germany and US, and later on, for example, from Belgium and Denmark. So we discussed this in the Swedish EPA, the Food Agency, and the Board of Agriculture, and put forward to the government that we should get an assignment to improve knowledge in Sweden about this. And this resulted in a three-year assignment and some funding in 2022 to 2024. To address some of the knowledge gaps we see, we have started up four par parallel ongoing projects. Uh, in the first project, we look at PFAS in food from stores. And the aim of this is to improve knowledge on exposure for the general population. And this work is done by the Swedish Food Agency and uh, the analytical work by Örebro University. 
it's composed of two parts. Uh, we do a food basket survey, and that means that the food agency are looking at consumption statistics, and they have uh, compiled composite samples from 17 different food categories that will be analyzed. Uh, we are also looking into individual food items from stores, and uh, this focus on food items identified as relevant based on previous individual measurements, previous food baskets, and previous national exposure assessments and the assessment in the EFSA opinion. So this part, there will be a lot of focus on meat, fish, some eggs, uh, fruits, and vegetables. In the next project, we're looking at PFAS in food produced close to contaminated sites. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we have a large number of contaminated sites in Sweden, and many farms are located close to these areas, but we lack information on if and when this is problematic. And to investigate this, we have assignments with the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, SLU, the organization VEXA that help us with sampling and Örebro University for the analytical work. Uh, to get some background on when local contamination can be problematic, SLU have done a literature review of transfer factors to assess what concentrations in feed and water that may be problematic for milk, meat and egg production. And this background is also intended to support operators responsible for and inspectors working with contaminated sites for their food control, but also for farmers. And I haven't included a link to this report in uh, the presentation, but it is now published. In the project, we are also investigating food produced close to contaminated sites. So, during this spring, we have recruited farms close to six contam contaminated areas for investigations of milk. And we have sampled milk from tank at each farm, feed and drinking water used for the animals. During this autumn, we are recruiting and sampling meat and blood from cattle. And you heard a little bit about milk from Den no, milk blood from Denmark before. There are mainly two reasons that we also include blood samples in this project. Uh, first, there might be some time gap between the animals being out in the fields grazing and the slaughter. And exposure might differ between being out grazing and when they are waiting in the barn. And since half-lives are relatively short for cattle, it might be good to have data for blood, uh, both when they get back, back from the fields and at time of slaughter to be better able to interpret the results for the milk and the feed and the water. Uh, further, this could also be used in the future as in Denmark, if there is a suspicion that the animals could have received contaminated feed or water then you could hopefully use blood samples to indicate if the meat will be allowed to sell after slaughter or if you need to put the animals on clean water and feed some time before you slaughter them. And we are also planning for sampling of eggs. Uh, we also have two more specific projects or or specific, uh, more slimmer projects. Uh, the first one is a project where we are looking at fish consumption and how that affects exposure. And this work is done, done by Linköping University, Linnaeus University, and Örebro University. Uh, they are looking into a cohort for which they have a survey data on locally sourced fish consumption and they will analyze blood samples from people with high and low consumption of locally sourced fish. Uh, they also have survey data uh, with information regarding where these cohorts used to catch fish. So the project will also include fishing from uh, 
lakes popular by this cohort and analyze PFAS content in that fish. Uh, besides looking into how consumption of these locally sourced fish affect PFAS exposure, the project will also evaluate possible links to health outcomes. And this will be done by looking at protein patterns in serum and self-reported information on health. Finally, we have a small project about PFAS in fungi and berries from a contaminated recreational area. Uh, at Frösund, Östersund in the middle of Sweden, we have a large contaminated area due to former fire training at the airport and also military fire training in the forest. Below here, I needed to in include some pictures in this presentation. You can see a map of the area. And uh, these dots represent results for different types of water samples. And as you can see, in some parts, they are really high. And this area is now used for recreation. And we get some questions if it is safe to pick and eat berries and fungi from this area and from similar areas. So in order to be able to better answer that type of questions, we have assigned SLU to sample and analyze berries and fungi from this area. And the sampling was done last autumn and we are now waiting for the report. The first three projects that I talked about will run until the end of 2024. And this last one is about to be finalized. And in the beginning of 2025, uh, we will report back to the government about our findings. So, thank you so much. That was all in my presentation. I can't hear you, Christina. I'm sorry, I, I thought I unmuted. Thank you so much. Very interesting talk. Um, there's a question in the chat. Are you going to monitor grain vegetables? Water will PFAS contaminated water. And if uh, not, do you know of anybody doing this? Uh, it's not included now in this project, but we are going to, we are also sampling feed and water used for the animals. So if we find high levels in milk or meat, uh, we will hopefully be able to backtrack the source to the contamination. Thank you very much. Yes, great. Thank you so much. So we turn to the last talk of this morning session before lunch, and it's researcher Ville Juntila from Finnish Environment Institute, and you're going to talk about temporal trends of PFAS concentrations in dated sediment cores from Finland and the Baltic Sea. So are you here, Ville yes. Juntila? Yeah. And can you share I'm, your screen? Yeah, I'm starting. No. And you should see my presentation. Yes, I can see it. Thank you so much. Great. So it's only me standing between you and the lunch. So bear with me just 15 minutes. So hello, everybody. And firstly, thank you for this invitation to speak in this seminar. So my name is Ville Juntila, and I am a researcher at Finnish Environment Institute and PhD student in University of Helsinki. And today I'm talking about PFAS concentration trends in dated sediment profiles. Uh, some persistent pollutants bind to sediment particles when they enter to the environment and with sedimentation, natural archives of historical environmental concentrations of hazardous substances are formed at the bottoms of the water bodies. And this same applies to long chain PFAS compounds, which, which are persistent and tend to bind to organic matter. And in our study, we collected sediment cores from various parts of Finland and examined the accumulation history of PFAS compounds in them. So our idea is that if we look into the past, and see where we are coming from, we'll get hints about which directions we should go in the future. 
So we collected sediment profiles from three inland sampling locations and four locations in the Baltic Sea. Three of those marine, marine sites are located in the Gulf of Finland and one in the Botnian Sea. And all of these inland sampling sites are small lakes that are not subject to direct human pressures. And two of them are located in Finnish Lapland, north of the Arctic Cycle, and one in southern Finland. And so the contamination comes from the transport of PFAS compounds into atmosphere. And therefore, it can be assumed that the results from these locations reflect larger scale changes in PFAS uh, manufacture and usage. And of course, the sampling points in the Baltic Sea receive PFAS loads from various different sources. Uh, here is an example of slicing of these sediment profiles. Uh, at most of our sampling points, the upper part of the profile was sliced more densely because we are particularly interested in recent changes in concentrations. And those profiles were measured for amount of organic material, the activity of radionuclides for sampling, uh, sample dating, and of course the concentrations of PFAS compounds. And we had analyses for 18 PFAS compounds, including perfluorocarboxylic acids and perfluorosulfonic acids. So in these figures, you can see the results concerning the development of PFAS concentrations. And as you can see at most sites, the sum concentrations have increased and the rate of increase has accelerated recently. And at few locations, the first appearance of PFAS compounds dates back to already before the 1915s, which to some degree may be due to downward le leaching of compounds in the sediment lowers. Uh, and at the few locations, you can also observe a temporary decrease in concentrations around the period of 2000 to 2010. And one reason for this could be the industrial discontinuation of PFOS used in early 2000s and the adaptation of alternative products. Uh, alongside changes in some concentrations, we can also investigate shifts in the PFAS profile, which indicates the compounds that have either increased or decreased in their share of the sum concentration. And the graphs here show that there has been change in the profile at many sampling sites. Uh, the most significant change is the decrease in the proportion of PFOS at some sites, which is clearly visible at these sites. And this was expected because PFOS use has ended in many countries. And conversely, this means that the proportion of other compounds have increased. And these plots maybe make it a little bit difficult to see, but the proportions of especially long chain carboxylic acids have increased. And I will show this in the next slide here. So these graphs show the concentrations of long chain carboxylic acids along with PFOS concentrations. And as you can see, the concentrations of PFCA compounds with nine or 11 carbons have increased particularly rapidly in many sampling sites. And uh, concentrations of PFOS have not decreased either, but its levels have not risen as rapidly as those of longer chain PFAS compounds. Uh, well, similar studies has been, have been conducted in other parts of the world. Uh, Logman et al. observed in the North Sea that after 2005, the total concentration of PFAS compounds started to decrease. Uh, and in our study, a similar change in concentrations was observed at a few locations, although after that, the concentration started to increase again. Then McInnes et al. observed a similar dip in concentration levels in a lake in Arctic Canada in the early 2000s, 
and their results also show a subsequent increase in concentration levels. And in another lake studied by McInnes et al, concentrations mostly increased with alliance with observations at certain sampling locations in our study. And at Tokyo Bay, Jushi et al have noted that some BFCA compound concentrations are rising while uh, PFOS concentration remains stable or even decrease. And I have to mention that other studies have also been conducted and it's, it's worth noting that sediment profile studies often do not reveal very clear trends in concentrations, uh, local sources of contamination and changes in them, as well as environmental conditions such as bioturbation can have significant impact on the occurrence of these compounds in sediment profiles. And that may explain some of the variation in our results as well. So as a conclusion, uh, well, the PFAS compound levels in water bodies of Finland seem to be on the rise. And this pattern is noticeable in numerous areas and for many compounds, including the PFOS, despite its restrictions. And concentrations of long-chain BFCA compounds are experiencing notably rapid increase. And sadly, finding PFAS-free water bodies is challenging due to atmospheric uh, deposition. Uh, Despite all the great presentations we have heard today, one could still imagine that if we go to the middle of the most beautiful Finnish Lapland wilderness and take environmental samples, those could be clean of PFASIS, but no, they aren't, and the levels seem to be even rising. And as the last remark, sediment studies do not tell about changes in environmental levels of short chain compounds as these substances typically do not bind to sediments. So we have to rely on other kinds of studies if we want to study them. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Quite worrying uh, results you're showing here. There's no questions yet in the Q and A uh, icon, and uh, hopefully they'll come later on. But I think people are a little bit eager to go to lunch, maybe. So, so I hope that people will ask questions in in the Q and A, and that presenters will answer. But let's go to lunch now, and we readjourn at the uh, quarter past one. So, see you again at a quarter past one. Have a very nice break and lunch now.